Uh, we're doing a study this summer in 1 Peter, a letter that the Apostle Peter wrote 2,000 years ago that still speaks with great power and relevancy to our, our day-to-day. In fact, we're going to see that in today's passage. Uh, we're going to be looking at chapter 2 of 1 Peter, verses 13 through 25, the end of the chapter. And here Peter's going to talk about how we should respond to authority in our lives. Is that a relevant topic or what? Now, authority, let's just start off by saying this. Authority is something that we all innately struggle with. We just do. Some more than others, but we all do. We don't like someone telling us what we need to do. We don't like to be bossed around. Who does? We don't like a lot of rules. It goes against our grain. But we need to see, and this is the important part of today's message, we need to see that our response to authority, God-ordained authority, is a great way to testify about the difference Jesus has made in our lives, simply by how we respond to that authority. Obeying those in authority and following the rules is one of the ways that we can show that we're submitting to God's authority. So vertical submission to God should be expressed in horizontal submission to those in authority. And it's all a part of how we demonstrate and that Jesus is in charge of our lives and that we can glorify Him. Now, how we respond to authority in general can be beautifully illustrated by the difference between cats and dogs. How many of you are dog lovers? You've had dogs, you love dogs. How many of you are cat lovers? You've had cats. The dog lovers outnumber the cat lovers, but both are beautiful, wonderful gifts from God. If you've had both, cat and a dog, at some point in your life, then you know that there is a tremendous difference between these two animals when it comes to how they respond to authority. If trained properly, a dog responds well to authority. You can get it to sit, you can get it to come, to fetch, to retrieve, to do all kinds of things. Try doing that with a cat. It will just look at you with disinterest and disdain. (laughs) With a dog, you can put it on a leash and get it to walk at your side and stop when you stop and go when you go. That's a dog. Try putting a leash on a cat. Have you ever tried that? Now, some cats, I know you're going to say, well, my cat used to love being on a leash. Most cats are going to fall down. They're going to fight that leash. You're going to have to drag them if you want to take them. That's most cats. Cats, by nature, are very independent, whereas dogs can be taught to be obedient. Dogs are willing to let you be in control if you train them right. But cats... Now, isn't this true? They think they're in control. (laughs) You don't own a cat. A cat owns you. In the same way, we, if we look at that illustration, it's just an illustration, but we can be rebellious and resistant to any kind of authority and resent anyone telling us what to do, if we want to be that way. But God wants us to choose, and it is a choice, to choose submission. Not because the one in authority is always right, but because that attitude is the one that best honors God. So yes, in life we need to be like a cat. I mean that. There may be times when we need to question authority. We need to be able to even at times defy authority if it's in the wrong. We don't need to be mindless drones, sheeple who just go along with what we're told, go along to get along. There needs to be some backbone sometimes to our our position. But overall, here's our default attitude. We need to be submissive when it comes to God-ordained authority. And this brings us to the what of what we're going to look at in our passage today in 1 Peter. In verse 13, Peter tells us to submit yourselves to every human institution, every human level of authority. The word submit is a Greek word that is a compound word. It's made up of two smaller words, hupo tasso. Hupo means to be under, hupo to be under. Tasso means to place. 
to place yourself under the authority of someone else. That's what the word means. This submission, placing yourself under someone's authority, needs to be voluntary. It must not be forced. So submission means to put yourself voluntarily under someone's authority. And it is not just submitting on the outside, but submitting also on the inside. It's all about attitude as well. It reminds me of a Dennis the Menace cartoon. Maybe you remember seeing this, where Dennis the Menace has done something wrong, and he's being scolded by his mom and told to sit in a corner. And as he sits there staring at the wall, he says, the cartoon says, I may be sitting on the outside, but I'm standing on the inside. And that's just a perfect representation of our defiant spirit often when it comes to authority, defiant. God wants us, however, to be submissive, not only on the outside compliance, but also on the inside to show respect. He wants our submission to come from the heart. Now, why? Why should we practice this? Well, this answer very simple, simply is given in verse 13 of chapter 2. Peter writes, he says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution. So why should we submit to imperfect authority? For the Lord's sake, for Jesus' sake. We don't do it because we voted for those who are in authority or because we agree with them or like them, but because this is a way that we honor our Lord Jesus. We do it for His sake. We do it because we want to submit to Jesus That's our ultimate authority, and He wants us to submit to those authorities in our life, whether it's a parent, a teacher, a coach, a referee, a politician, a boss, a mayor, a governor, or even our president. We do it for Jesus' sake, because this is one of the ways that we honor Him. Now that we know what we're to do, submit to authority, and why we're to do it for the Lord's sake, Then let's look at three spheres of authority that we are to submit. Peter's going to list three areas that we are to practice submission. In the civil arena, we're going to look at that in verses 13 through 17 of chapter 2. And then in the workplace, where we go to work, a boss-employee-employer relationship. And then we'll look at, next time, authority and submission in the home, chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. We'll look at that next time. Let's look today, though, at the first two. First of all, we are to practice submission in the civil arena. This has to do with our submission towards civil authority. Peter writes this in verse 13. He says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men, and do not use your freedom, however, as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves submitted to God. Honor all people. Here he summarizes our general attitude toward authority. Honor all people, love the brotherhood of believers, fear God, honor the king. Peter tells us that we need to be submitting ourselves to our governing authorities. And this agrees with the Apostle Paul, what he said in Romans chapter 13, verse 1, when he tells us to be in subjection to our governing authorities. Both Peter and Paul agree. This needs to be our default attitude, one of respect, one of honor, one of submission. So submission to authority is our default attitude. And you need to remember the historical context. Peter's writing in the first century to a group of people who have had to flee because of government persecution. Think of that. Who is on the throne of Rome? Who is the emperor of Rome at this time? Well, it's Nero. Uh, Let me give you the brief bio to Nero, one of the most fascinating madmen in history that has ever reigned. Nero came to power when he was just 16 years of age. Imagine being suddenly the the emperor, the Caesar of an entire empire, the Roman Empire, at 16 years of age. It'd be like being the president at 16. What? 
He was unprepared. He was pushed there by his manipulative mother. He wasn't ready for the job at all. When he was 17, his sick nature began to appear, and he put to death, he killed uh, his first person, his first victim. It was a friend of his at court at age 17. He poisoned him. And then when he was 18, he plotted to kill his own mother. Finally, he had enough of her pushy ways. And he tried, and it failed, and he tried three times and finally succeeded, and he killed his mother. On July 19th, it's a very important date in history, on July 19th, 64 AD, a major fire occurred in the city of Rome, burning much of that city. Many blamed Nero because they knew that he wanted to to destroy the slums that had grown so prevalent in the city and rebuild a new city uh, in his honor. But Nero needed someone to blame, and so for a scapegoat, he pointed his finger at Christians, and he said, it was the Christians who started this fire. If you want to be mad for someone who burned you out of your home, it's those Christians who did it. Well, From 64 AD on, Christianity uh, began to be persecuted. They've always been subject to persecution, but here it was state-sponsored, state-endorsed persecution, and it was ruthless. This is when Christians living in round Rome had to go underground into the catacombs to hide. This is when Christians started using the secret password of the fish, the ichthus, as a password between them. It was dangerous to be a Christian. This is when the people to whom Peter is writing had to scatter, leave their communities for their lives, and go to five provinces in and around what is now modern-day Turkey because of this government persecution. It was an unsafe time to be a follower of Christ. Now, folks, this is, Im- this is important. Even in this context, a persecution Peter tells Christians to still obey their authorities. In other words, here's what he's saying. Don't give them, the opposition, a reason to persecute you by being rebellious. Show them by your behavior that you are not a threat to civil order and stability. Show them by being law-abiding citizens that you are not the problem. You are not a troublemaker. You are not those who go out and destroy public and private property just because you don't get your own way. This is what Peter means in verse 15 when he says, for such is the will of God, this is what God's will is for you, that by doing right, that means in this context, obeying the law, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Silence the ignorance What's he talking about? Well, again, you need to know some historical context. As Christianity grew and spread, a lot of rumors developed around it, many false rumors, many false accusations. Early Christians were accused of insurrection because they held to a higher loyalty than just Caesar. They held their allegiance to a higher king, Jesus. And so for some, that was a threat. They were accused of incest because they called each other brothers and sisters, one big family. To an outsider, that sounded weird. They were accused of cannibalism because they ate the flesh and drank the blood of another during communion. And again, to an outsider, that sounded sick, weird. Now, what do you do when you're being falsely accused? Think about in your life, how would you react if you're falsely accused? Well, the normal reaction is to fight back, to sue for slander, to fight fire with fire, to do whatever you can to defend yourself, to hire a lawyer. But Peter here is pointing to a higher and better way. He tells us to silence our critics by how we live. Show them you are not who they say you are. They think you're a troublemaker. Show them that you are not a troublemaker. Show them by your behavior you are not a threat. Show them you are not disloyal to Caesar or to a governor, even though you give your higher allegiance to Jesus. Show them by your behavior. You know, right now in many groups, 
Christians are being viewed as a hate group. We need to show them by our behavior and how we treat every person, any person, that we are not a hate group. We may not agree always with what is woke or politically correct today, but that doesn't make us hateful. And we are not hateful people. We will treat everyone and anyone with kindness and dignity and respect. That's how we should behave. So Peter is telling them in the first century and us today, be a law-abiding citizen and silence the foolish rumors from ignorant people who are making false allegations against you. Now, some people today, unfortunately, think the answer when you're not getting your way is to revolt, defy the law, claim the president is not my president. Some people advocate that we lead demonstrations in the city. Remember last summer, the summer of love? Uh, Burn flags, destroy storefronts, turn over cars, and tear down statues. But the Bible never, now this is important, the Bible never endorses revolt and rebellion. It just doesn't. Instead, it tells us to pray for those in authority. If you're taking notes, write down 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. There Paul, the Apostle Paul, tells us to pray for those in positions of authority, to pray for them. Never underestimate the power of prayer in changing things. Now, let me balance that by saying, yes, there may come a time when the government will tell us to do something that the Bible forbids, something that goes against the Bible. Then the answer very simply is we must obey God rather than man. We must. It is then that if we have to, we have to practice civil disobedience and accept the consequences. Our author, it's interesting, our author who's saying submit to authority, he himself knew how to practice civil disobedience. When the Jewish high council in Jerusalem forbade the early Christians from sharing publicly the name of Jesus, don't speak anymore in the name of this Jesus, it was Peter who spoke stood up and said to that Jewish high council, the Sanhedrin, he told them we must obey God rather than man. Acts chapter 5, verse 29. So Peter knew there may come a time when we might have to defy civil authority. But hopefully that is the exception, that is the extreme. That is something we do only when the government is telling us to do something that directly contradicts our faith that violates our deeply held convictions. So there may come a time when we choose not to comply. If something violates your deeply held convictions, let's be honest, like being forced to take an unproven and experimental injection into your body, it's a very personal thing, then you must do what your conscience tells you to do no matter what the social shaming or social pressure may be. What we need to get back to is that in America, a free society, we are to be governed, not ruled. There is a difference. Yet today, we are seeing more and more government dictates and mandates. That's contrary to a free people in a free society. Just this week, I was reading from a book by Francis Schaeffer. How many of you remember, some of you older ones might remember Francis Schaeffer, who was a great intellectual Christian thinker who influenced many uh, in today's society of Christian thought. And Francis Schaeffer, in his book that became a film series, How Shall We Then Live, back in 1976 is when it was published, he predicted this, that humanist, secular elites, he called them elites, in the media, universities, and our government would exploit a coming crisis. He didn't know what that crisis would be, but that when it came, it could be an economic crisis, a health crisis, a military crisis, that these elites, the ruling class, would exploit this coming crisis to persuade apathetic Americans, that's his phrase, apathetic Americans, to accept a manipulative authoritarian government in order to have peace and safety. 
He made that prediction back in 1976, 45 years ago. Folks, in many ways, we're seeing the expression of that. So, more than ever, we need to be wise as serpents, wise as serpents, but harmless, innocent as doves. Matthew 10, 16, Jesus gave us those marching orders. We need to submit to authority in the civil arena, be good citizens, law-abiding, up until it violates deeply held convictions, until it violates our conscience, then we must choose to obey God rather than man and accept the consequences. So that's our basic position towards civil authority. Our default submission, respect, and honor up until they're violating what we believe God is wanting us to do, our deeply held convictions. Let's go to another area where we're to practice submission, and that's the workplace. The second area is submission in the workplace. Peter writes in verse 18, he says, servants, in their context, it was slaves and masters, so he addresses that. He says, servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor with God. If for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you, are, when you sin, do wrong, and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience, you're getting what you deserve. But if when you do what is right and suffer for it and patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. In the first century, again, for the historical context, this had to do with slaves toward masters. Today, we can apply it to the workplace uh, relationship between employers and employees, bosses, foremen, and those who work for them. I know that the relationship is not the same. We are nobody's slaves. But the principles are the same. We are to submit to authority. That's our default attitude in the workplace. Even if you don't like the person in charge. Even if you don't agree with the decision being made. And even if you are being treated unfairly. There's a way to address that. But you are not to rebel and revolt. Instead, you're to leave it to God. Now, this does, now let me be clear here because there's, imagine in your mind you're thinking, well, what about this? This doesn't excuse a person in a position of authority of taking sexual advantage of one of the employees, a sexual predator. Of course you're to defy that. Of course you're to say no to that. And it doesn't mean doing something illegal because your boss wants you to do something. Cook the books and you've got to go along. No, you need to respectfully say, I'm not doing that. No. If, you, if your boss, your foreman, whoever's in charge, wants you to do something that is illegal, immoral, or life-threatening, you have every right to say no. Again, the principle is you must obey God rather than man. Right now, we have the onus of injections being put in the workplace. That for many people, that if in order to keep your job, you have to get this injection or you could lose your job. Again, if that's your conscience, you don't want that injection, that's up to you. And you have every right to respectfully say no. And the best advice I've been given, I've heard, is that if they say it's your job on the line, let them fire you. Make sure it's a part of the record. But this is the crazy times in which we're living. It's not getting easier, folks. And here, we need to respect people's decisions. And if you decide you want to get injected, great. If you don't, if you're part of the wait-and-see crowd that wants to wait, you have that right as well. And here at North Shore Bible Church, we are never going to discriminate between the vaccinated or the unvaccinated. We're going to treat everyone with kindness and dignity and respect and equality, regardless of this, we are not going to let the civil government or any government divide us as a church on this issue. Amen, folks?
And I know we can have strong views. That's just the way it is. And depending on who you're listening to, what Kool-Aid you're drinking, whichever side that is that you're listening to, you look at the other side as being foolish. You do. We need to get off our high horse, humble ourselves a little bit, and realize, hey, wait a minute, these are complex things. When you're asking someone to take something into their body, give people the right to choose whether they choose to do so or not. Well, you're threatening everybody else. Calm down. Just calm down. And let's realize that we each have that right. And here at North Shore, we're going to respect your right. Whatever that is. Get injected, not injected. That's up to you. But we are not going to let it come before us in Christ. We're not. So, in the workplace, you may have to come to that situation where your boss says, get injected, or you will lose your job. God help you. God bless you. If your conscience, your deeply held conviction says, I just don't want to do this, I don't want to take this into my body, then stand, let them fire you. If that's what it comes to. So, again, we need to be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves, especially in today's day. But let's not fight and divide over this. And you don't need to email me and say, well, I don't agree with you. Calm down. Realize there are two sides on this issue, and each one is using science and the medical community, depending on who you're listening to, to support their view. I mean, we're being played in some way. So let's not enter into it and fight with each other and divide over this. That's my plea. So, how, and when it comes to workplace, Paul's or Peter's main focus is to be model employees. Uh, just work hard, be respectful, don't badmouth your boss, your foreman, your employer behind his or her back. Uh, work hard with diligence, not for the money but for Jesus Christ, for his sake, because we serve a higher master. That should be our attitude. If you're looking for a passage that will reinforce this, Colossians chapter 3, verses 20 through, 22 through 25, Colossians chapter 3, 22 through 25, the Apostle Paul gives the same message. Uh, do all that you do, do it for the sake of Christ in honor of him. Now, how... How, in this fallen, broken world, do we maintain a submissive attitude in an imperfect world? Well, let me now bring you to the how. How do we do it? Well, we do it by following Jesus' example. Follow our leader. How did he respond when he was unfairly, unjustly treated? Well, Peter tells us. Notice in verses 21 through 25, the end of the chapter of chapter 2, Peter writes, for you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, that is, insulted, he did not revile, insult, and return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually strained like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. How do we submit to people in authority when they're less than perfect? Well, we do it by following Jesus' example. He left us an example to follow. When he was cursed... Think of during his trial, he did not curse back when he was on the cross and they were laughing at him and insulting him. He did not return the same. When he was insulted, he did not insult back. When he was punched as he was during his trial, he did not punch back. When he was spat upon, he did not spit back. Uh, he did the opposite of what often our human nature wants to do. He didn't act in kind. Instead, Jesus entrusted himself to his heavenly Father who judges righteously. I love that. He entrusted himself. God, you take care of this. To his heavenly Father, Father, you take care of this. He left it with God to set things right. Wow, such trust. 
And this is the kind of trust that we need to have in our lives. Father, you take care of this, this issue in my life. So why should we submit even when it's unfair and it seems like it's unfair to us? Well, we do it because we submit to Jesus and we follow in His footsteps. We do it because submission honors God. And finally, we do it because submission ultimately is the best way to change a situation, bring about lasting change. Remember this, love conquers evil. And so as all of possible, we show respect, dignity, and honor to those in authority. We may have to say no respectfully, but we stand our ground. We don't give in, but we always do it in a submissive way, in a say of saying honoring way, I should say. Who do you have, as we close and think about this, who do you have a hard time right now submitting to? Who do you have a tendency to rant and rave against? Think about your last few conversations. Whatever it is, and it's, te- it's easy to do that today, the media kind of feeds this. Whoever it is, whatever it is, I want to ask you to pause, just pause, long enough to remember how Jesus handled injustice in this world. How did he handle it? Follow his example. I believe that's what the Lord would want us to do. So now that I got things stirred up in here, let's bow our heads, shall we? Let's bow our heads. Father, we do live in crazy times when we see uh, more and more uh, concerns and safety and all this and, and trying to force people to do one thing or another. We just pray for wisdom and guidance and direction in our own lives and to be supporting each other's right to that same decision and uh, not bullying or social shaming. Help us not to be a part of that. Help us to have our own convictions and follow them. But Father, help us to always keep the central thing in mind, the big thing, the big thing, and that's allegiance to you, that we follow you. We submit our lives to you. Give us wisdom and guidance as a church family as we move through these difficult times. Help us to always show faith over fear. And help us to live and be a light for you in this community. We ask your blessing now. In Jesus' precious name, amen.